Welcome back to the Traders Network Show and our continued coverage of Humanity 2.0. I'm Matt Bird, broadcasting worldwide from Rome, Italy, for Equities.com and our affiliate partners. My next guest is Jose Pacheco. Did I get that right? Perfect. He is the co-director of the Master's Degree of Advanced Manufacturing Design for MIT. And he's going to be our eyes and ears and give us a little feedback and comments here in yesterday's events. Um, Jose, welcome to the show. Thank you. Ah, it's a pleasure to be here. The pleasure is all mine. Uh, you know, when I found out you were coming in, I, I just I had to have you in here. I saw you um, saw you motoring around yesterday. Um, so we, we saw a lot of things yesterday, uh, a lot of panels, a lot of impact, a lot of advocacy, uh, a lot of a lot of influential organizations all coming together to figure out how to solve some social problems. That's right. Um, I spent the majority of my time doing outtakes and interviews. Uh, you were inside. What was your takeaway? I think that uh, the companies that were there and some of their partners that they're working with are thinking about very deeply what are the ethical implications of the technologies they're deploying. And so these emerging technologies, uh, the most recent one of course is artificial intelligence, we're all talking about that, but this is a conversation that has been going on for well over 70 years now, you know, since uh, after World War II when we started talking about the impact of uh, splitting the atom, we had scientists and engineers trying to figure out what do we do with this and how do we manage this responsibly. Then we had the biotechnology revolution mm. and then we had synthetic biology. Now we have artificial intelligence. Uh, we have encryption, which is mm -hmm. kind of an emerging new technology in mm -hmm. some ways, and autonomous vehicles, autonomous uh, robots. Uh, and there's more that certainly we be, uh, are seeing in the lab. And so, Having this ongoing conversation and seeing that these companies are undertaking it in a very thoughtful way is actually very heartening. And I think that's very important, both for the companies, as companies, but also as members of society and for the planet in general. Do you think it's, a, it's, it's corporations' obligation on an ethical side to actually start participating like we saw yesterday? versus what's, the other, what's coming down the pipeline on the regulatory side, which is the forced participation? Yeah, well, uh, obligation or responsibility is what we like to call it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, every company is made up of people. Mm -hmm. And we, as people, uh, participate in communities. We participate in our local communities. Mm -hmm. And so it's our responsibility as citizens of those communities mm -hmm. and of the planet. Um, and so it's... Um, also important for us as members of industry to undertake the hard thinking that we need to do to understand what the implications are of what we're doing. Because in the end, really, we're the only ones that know what the implications may be at the very beginning because we're deep into it, mm -hmm. right? And so by the time uh, regulation comes along, it's because usually something has gone wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to be proactive. And so it is responsibility, well, for it, sure. Is that always the case? So I, I think what we're seeing is a bit of an, a bit, a bit different um, because a lot of the regulation that regarding privacy and, and data mm -hmm. and what's governing what's gonna be the future of potentially AI and those sorts of things, those regulations, those policies were written in time where we couldn't even anticipate or even you know fathom the idea of a social network like Facebook mm -hmm. so if those 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 regulations were rewritten today what would they look like <laughs> that's a great question uh, well we are also starting to see for the first time what it means for us to have privacy uh, potentially or no privacy right? well I mean and, and, and that's the question because yeah we freely give away our, our, our data. So is there actual privacy in data? Or do we actually have ownership? Mm. I think that's not something we even assumed was possible to mm -hmm. question 30 years ago, right? Um, but now everything that is being quantified about us mm -hmm. is valuable. And so that's a whole new way of thinking about ourselves as mm -hmm. well, right? It's not just what we do physically, but everything we do digitally and how we interact with the world, both physical and digital. And so, um, but there's no way I think we could have anticipated that except to say that you know, we have to understand what, that we have impact upon the world. So we have to think about from a regulatory framework perhaps, 
um, or just from a governance perspective, what are the potential expansions of who we are, literally who we are and what it means to be you, know, you and to That's be right. me? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I uh, uh, I spent a lot of time on the governmental side, covering a lot of the social impact issues, and, and as, as on the practice side, with the communication um, for emerging growth companies, and you know we're seeing this convergence of of um, job responsibility protecting laws, mm -hmm. and some of them may be obsolete, but yet they're still trying to protect the integrity of them, and we're seeing now conflicting stuff because the DNA of how data is used today is much different than what the laws were that crafted the regulatory issues of how they should work. And so we're, it's like this, there's this huge gray area of, of, of businesses operating in. And I think that's, you know, I think AI is going to push the boundaries of regulatory and puts the boundaries of private industry of how they're going to regulate because they're just going to remove themselves <laughs> for the most part from a lot of that process. So how they automate that's going to be pretty amazing. Um, moving on, um, equities is a emerging growth network, how is, how is this next wave of technology going to affect the emerging growth markets? Oh, it's, uh, it's a really, really interesting time, actually, I think, for business in general. Startups, yeah. uh, equities, are being impacted by technologies that are now converging that used to be separate. Oh. And you know, in my work that I focus mostly on uh, manufacturing and design, uh, everybody's heard of 3D printing, which is a form of additive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it impacted, you know, 20, 30 years ago when it first came out. So it's even though a, it's... Has it been that long? Yeah, the first patents for 3D printing actually were in the 80s. And the first company was founded in the late 80s. And a colleague from MIT actually started one of those and sold her first 3D printing company in the early 2000s. Is that right? Yeah. So that's the other thing about technology is that by the time it becomes popular and you know part of our everyday lexicon it's been 20 30 years you know i, I think I, as a kid i remember looking back thinking oh that's not possible and i'm watching something like out of the movie alien them printing a gun or whatnot right i'm like that's not possible i'm like and it's been it really was <laughs> it was really it was really working interesting but you, that's you're right right yeah, and yeah. so now but and so you know you, you talk about these technologies coming from the lab being Kind of having a proof of concept and I think that's where you begin to see some of the science fiction kind of aspects is like wow if it worked once or it worked twice in the lab but now how do you actually produce it on a mass scale or how do you use it uh, produce it economically mm. right and so that was the first part but then now we start thinking about for example this concept of uh, well, another important technology in 3D printing was the ability to develop the 3D models digitally so that you can actually print them, right? Right. And yeah. so those two now start to come together. The medical devices field is, I mean, uh, you know, med tech, um, the whole medical devices field, it's like the 3D printing is, 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 is removing the, um, the molding, procurement process, all that stuff, That's taking right. a, a CAD design, turning it into the, the fundamental, you know, beta product and then from there, and it's usable. That's right. And it's, as we now have new emerging materials, so mm -hmm. the technology of materials emerging, you begin to use new materials. So it's not just plastic yeah. anymore. It's metals, right? It's composites. In some cases, actually, it's biomaterials. It's actual cells that are being wow. printed into a matrix. And um, this convergence of technologies then is what creates so much power. And so when we think about it from the perspective of a company and how they deliver value to the customer, because at the end, that's ultimately what every company has to do. Mm -hmm. They have to design something that meets customer needs, do it economically, reliably, and consistently, repeatedly. Um, and so these new emerging technologies are allowing them to do that. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to use less energy, less material, less waste, right? And so when you're able to do that, that's less cost. That hopefully means better financial performance. I mean, just by definition, by less cost, less use of material, um, you're able to perform better. I, uh, Boeing, as one example, talks about uh, a very important concept for Boeing or any, uh, like Airbus is the uh, 
the weight to fly ratio, right? So when you're making a part for a plane, you might get 20 kilograms of uh, metal. And because you have to machine it, you then make a part that only weighs one kilogram. So waste is 19 kilograms, right? Wow. And so, but if you're able to 3D print that part, there's right, no waste. There's hardly any waste. It right. might be on the order of grams because you have to finish it, right. um, you know, machine it at the end. But yes, so now if you're able to do that wow. consistently and you're eliminating, you know, 80, 90% of the material you used to buy, mm -hmm. Less shipping costs, right? Less material that you have to buy, less waste that you actually have to pay to be carried away. And so this is one of the, I think, the aspects of these emerging technologies with respect to financial performance that's very important that we have to think about. And it's not just these, but some of the things mm -hmm. that are coming from the lab that you know, do seem like science fiction as well. You know, I'd like to have you back on the show a little later. We, we, we broadcast at the NASDAQ, uh, and we do a weekly, and, and, and in, some, in some cases, da daily episodes. And I'd love to have you back on the show at a later time, if that, that would be all right. Sure, absolutely. What I'd like to do is cut to a quick commercial break. I want to keep you for another segment. Okay. Come back and, and have a little chat. Let's, let's bring this back full circle to Humanity 2.0. Sure. And I'll let you get you on your way. So you head back to, Sounds good. Head back to the U.S. Does that <laughs> sound good? All right, we'll be right back after these messages. Just don't go away. Welcome back to the Traders Network Show. Jose, thanks for sticking around. I really appreciate sure. it. So um, circling back around to the Humanity 2.0, um, it's difficult to say something like this, uh, especially when you're intimately involved and, and you know everybody, but what was your favorite panel? <laughs> That's a <laughs> trick question. Jeez. <laughs> uh, um, well, I would have to say <laughs> uh, the the panel on the ethics of emerging technology, for sure. Um, that aspect is obviously near and dear to my heart, being at MIT. Um, but it's also um, important that we had these different conversations. Not everyone agreed. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different exactly. people. Exactly. Because some people look at, at business ethics as sustainable. Some people look at business ethics as how I treat the customer. Yes. Some people look at business ethics as other, other things. Yes. And that, you know, actually, that is the conversation on an ongoing basis that uh, we're also having at MD Academy. Um, so for us, uh, we have, for example, talk about sustainability, right? We are growing the campus. We just uh, finished a new building where we're doing a lot of research that requires a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And so we have a co-generation plant and we cre uh, built a second co-generation plant that burns natural gas. But That's we're also gonna be carbon neutral by 2030. So how do you reconcile that? And I think for us, being in a university, we said, well, our mission has to be to show to lead the way and show how that's possible. Mm -hmm. My colleagues at MIT, including Julie Newman, um, <laughs> have looked at this and said, well, you know, the ideal thing to do would be to get energy from a solar farm. But here in New England, it's very difficult to put up a solar farm. Mm. And so through some financial engineering that they were able to uh, develop th uh, with colleagues from um, MIT Sloan, as well as some uh, third party company, they were able, MIT was able to invest in a solar farm in South Carolina that took off the grid, a coal burning uh, power plant. And so it reduced the huge amount of carbon being emitted. And so even though that power plant or that solar farm is farther away from MIT, it still reduced our carbon footprint. Okay. And we didn't use that electricity. We actually sold it to the local community, right? That's part of kind of the financial engineering. And using those funds, then we're able to pay for additional electricity at MIT. So, it's when we think about you know the ethics of an organization, uh, it's about acting upon what your mission and what the leadership says mm. your uh, priorities are. In our case, we said we have to grow because that's what's best for the research and for students, but it also means that we have to figure out a way how to be carbon neutral. And so it's not just about technology, it's about management and leadership and finance. 
everything has to come together in order for us to meet that. Mm. Um, and I, you know, uh, to use a different metaphor, 40 years ago, everybody knew in manufacturing that quality cost extra. Mm -hmm. right? And then Toyota came along and they said, no, actually quality is part of the way we do business. And if you do it right, you're actually gonna perform financially better. Right. And so uh, now everybody knows that sustainability costs extra. One of the things we're realizing is if you do it right, no, actually you will do better mm. and you'll be more competitive. And so from a, the perspective of the universities, I think we have an opportunity to lead the way. And so mm. coming back to ethics, right? Nobody, perhaps uh, everybody in the panel didn't agree on what it was, but they knew it was important in a way to make a positive impact. And I think that's the key takeaway. How do you operate in a positive, impactful way in the world? Is it possible that ethics and business is all of it, all encompassing? If you can't agree of, of what, 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 what the mechanism for it is, maybe it is, is it all. It's all encompassing. So hmm. is sustainability part of the business ethic you know, tree is, yeah. is, uh, is, you know, is renewable energy on tactical part of that tree is yeah. CSR or corporate social responsibility part of that, you know, that, that tree of life for business ethics. You know, maybe, maybe it's, it isn't one thing, maybe it is, it's more than one thing. It for sure is. It's, I think you're right. It's all encompassing. And what's different is we are constantly learning how to do it better mm -hmm. and how to have less ecological impact, mm -hmm. right, as well as figuring out how to do it better from a human-to-human -human perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, through various experiments, some through startups, um, some larger organizations, CSR pro projects, we're understanding that there may be different ways of doing it. Um, I think uh, to give another plug uh, that got a lot of attention yesterday, Patagonia was mm -hmm. an example that has a lot of programs that are socially responsible at the people level as well as from the ecological level. And uh, just by the fact that they showed these examples, you're able to see that, oh, you could do it that way and still actually do really well economically. And I think that's what we, we try to find um, and unearth is these examples where things do make sense um, and can be guides, if you will, for operating in business. Is it okay for an organization ethically to align their goals with a sustainable mission because it aligns their business goals? Of course. I think that's part of what mm -hmm. you have to do now. So I think that's, you know, you know, I, you know, as we unravel this, that's the thing that I think these organizations need to take a look at is uh, climate change, okay, why do we need it to stop? And it may be self-determining for us wanting to stop it because Patagonia is a great example. Yeah. Right? Climate change is not so good. Uh, we need consistent weather patterns because we have our gear, yeah. right? Um, you know, we need, you know, we have, you know, you know, gender equality. I mean, there, there's all those fundamental things with it and how to operate a business. Um, we well, had a chance to interview the, uh, the gentleman from, from Patagonia yesterday, yeah. and he was terrific. Uh, very, very humble and uh, soft-spoken, but uh, he, he cer they certainly have a, a direction and a path, and they're proud of it. Yeah. They're very good at it. Yeah, and they're also, you know, being where we are, to use the word, they're evangelizing, Yes. right? And I think that's important, um, because in the same way that we did this project for the, um, for the solar farm, it took us a while to kind of get our minds around how this would work, and now that we have kind of figured it out, there's other organizations, other universities that are doing it. And when I asked my colleagues as to why it's taken so long, if this is so obvious, they said, well, you know, it, it took us a year to figure it out. There's lack of knowledge, and then you've got to figure out the mechanism to do it. But once you figure it out, it can be replicated. And that's what we need, more examples where someone has figured it out and then allows us to replicate it. Repeatable results, Absolutely. they say. Repeatable results. Yeah. Well, listen, we, we, we ran out of time for today. Uh, I'd love to have you back on the show. Thank you. All right. And ladies and gentlemen, we have Jose Pacheco. 
the, uh, let me see if I get this right, <laughs> co-director of master's degree of advanced manufacturing design for MIT. Jose, thanks for coming on the show. I, I really appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. Yeah, uh, you're watching the Traders Network show. We'll be right back with our next guest. Don't go away.